essay once about, uh, it's called Pages of the Coloring Book. And it talks about how, as a really young child, I was really influenced by the, the actual coloring book that you just the commercial coloring book you buy in a store. But I was not like most children that was uh, eager to fill in the color with crayons or watercolor, whatever they were using. I really was struck by the black lines and how they connected and how they kind of stood on their own, even though they seduced you to produce color. They, they were strong enough on their own, and I think that kind of led me into my interest when I was in academia into the black and white uh, abstract expressionists. I fell into their path very easily. And they kind of led me into being opened up to someone that I would never expect, which was Charles Schultz and his black line construction. But he said the path that he took, he felt that it was the path he wanted to take and that it allowed him to do something that had never been attempted in cartooning before. So people like that that try to do things that have broken barriers and try to see it in a new way are people that really influenced me the most. Until I found them, I didn't really have artistic expression. I think I was just a student, which I still am, but I feel like I was only just a student in that period of time. The academia, I thought made sense until I started my early initial studies of what Charles Schultz's line construction story for me. That really made everything that I studied in, in archidem, academia from undergraduate to graduate and postgraduate. It all made sense all of a sudden. He brought it all together for me, which I wasn't expecting that a cartoonist was going to do that for me. Especially a cartoonist who never even stepped one foot in academia. It was totally self-taught. So many people have thought of it as a kind of detour, you know, on the journey that I've been really working on all these 35, 36 years with the Schultz and Inspired work. Um, but it really wasn't a detour. It was more of a uh, experimental layover <laughs> on the journey. It was. It's still everything that I practice visually is in this work. I just left out the Schultz imagery, which made the title of the show, Hide and Seek, very applicable to what I was doing because without the references in the work, many people, visually or mentally, played a game of Hide and Seek with the work. Mm -hmm. uh, but it was something that I wanted to do for years. Being in Tahiti makes you Especially when you look around and you look in magazines, or just there's small little galleries. There are waterscapes and landscapes of Tahiti's everywhere, and it makes you want to do them, you know. But I don't want to do just landscape paintings that would be nothing to be learned to gain from that. So I had to figure out a way to one day express what I was seeing and feeling there without just being redundant and repetitive as a landscape would. And it really wasn't until COVID when I was doing so much work because I wasn't being interrupted that I actually ended up having a little bit of time left over to do this body work that I've been wanting to do for a long time. And I, I don't mean to name drop, I want to do it one time and then at the end of it. But um, I had Diana Ross in my studio, a um, good friend of ours. But one day, just the two of us for a couple hours and Diana and her last husband, the father of two of our best friends, had a little island not too far from where we are in Tahiti. It was surprising, I, I think probably before we did. And our two friends grew up there as young children. And she was in the studio, and so she had the connection that I had. She knew the, the feeling and the love for the place. And, she's, and she would see in the background of all the Schultz imagery, there'd be a little background of Bora Bora or something from Tahiti in the background. And she commented several times, wouldn't it be great if you just pulled those out and did a whole body of work of nothing but that? And I kind of laughed it off and thought, yeah, I'd like to do that, but I don't want to ever get time to do it. And that was probably six or seven, maybe eight years ago that she suggested that. So she really did have a spark in this in the ignition of, of me being able to do this work. So after COVID, I had some, a little bit of free time to do this as well, 
and I was doing it along with the other work, so it wasn't departing it. Like I said, it was just kind of a layer. Um, and I actually wanted it to say hide and seek because it's actually the subject matter of the work, and not having the characters in the work allowed it to have that title very comfortably. Uh, the, this show and this body of work that's in here is actually a collision of two bodies of work. Mm -hmm. The first body was the one we were just discussing about the imagery of Tahiti. And in Tahiti, if you are there personally, and if you look at this work closely, by the way, you'll notice that it doesn't really look like Tahiti. I mean, I wish it had these colors, <laughs> but it doesn't. I mean, most of you get up on the islands and there, the wood is weathered, the, the trees are just hanging on from the storms. And there's not color like this, but this is what it feels like. And since the beginning of time of this body of work that I've been doing for 36 years, it's never what something looks like, it's always what it feels like. Even when I use a character, it's not who the character is, it's what the character is representing to you to feel. So all of these are representing what Tahiti feels like, not, not what it looks like. In Tahiti, if you're actually there, the game of hide and seek that kids all over the world know is so around you, completely. Fish are hiding from other fish, like smaller fish from larger fish. Fish are hiding in coral from other fish. Uh, some fish are turning their bodies in, in the water so metallic that their skin hits the sun differently and they disappear in the birds above. Trying to eat them can't get them. Um, so there's, and even the islands disappear and come back because the storms are constantly in and out all day. So, the, so a game of hide and seek, especially mentally, is always there. That was a good excuse for doing the same body of work that I wanted to do at the time. Uh, I mean, my, I, my thinking really kind of never stops. One, one of the things that I do is I paint from uh, not being alive, but the feeling of being alive. And so I'm, I'm constantly watching what's going on in the world. I've often said in interviews that I'm a visual social anthropologist in that the work is an anthropological study of the visual and a visual study of the anthropological. So I already had something planned to do when I was about to do this work, and it was mostly about, uh, there's a quote that I've written on the back of all of these that, <clears throat> that I was given by my grandmother when I was a very young child by Mama Max. And the quote goes something like, I have more respect for a man who lets me know where he stands even if he's wrong, then the one who comes up like an angel is nothing but a devil. And I have felt, being an anthropologist as well, watching the world in the last decade, especially since COVID, that people have lost, many people, especially political and corporate leaders, have lost their intellectual honesty, their, their true selves, because they're trying to seek out a new identity or a new book to police people, or just narcissistically to make themselves feel better. So I really wanted to do a work about this loss of, of intellectual honesty that I was watching. So I felt like these people, these politicians, these corporate leaders, they're hiding and they're seeking out because they're hiding themselves and they're seeking out new identities. So it kind of worked with this work that's always in the high and seek stages in reality. So I put the two together and I thought, What's really happening is, is these people that I'm referring to, such as politicians and corporate leaders, are playing games with us, which is why the name of the show is Hide and Seek as well. A lot of people try to think of ideas. I'm not one of them. I'd rather expect the, accept the irresistible possibilities of what I can't ignore. And I felt that for at least 36 years back to when I was in 1988 diagnosed with stage four cancer. And because I'd had two 10 hour surgeries in a year of chemotherapy and was given two weeks to two years to live, I felt like now I understand what I really can't ignore is living. And not just living, but the feeling of being alive. 
The biggest challenge when you walk into the studio is working on the painting because of the wind, the temperature, the bugs. You have to cover, overcome all of that first because my studio is that side. It's covered with a thatch roof, but it's open around so you can see so the outside is coming in. The work's constantly rained on. Um, sometimes it has escaped into the lagoons and we have to retrieve it. But I marine proof the watercolor paper so that it can take being sunken into the sea and survive quite nicely, actually. Uh, so that's the biggest challenge is physically being able to do the work. But once the work happens, it's, it's wonderful because no one's interrupting you. Um, everything around you is so up and, and positive at the moment that there's no way that you can't enjoy doing the work. I think because they were work gotten from some of the larger scale works. And so more time was spent on them, more layering was done on them. They're, they look like originals. Um, all three of them, I have people all the time questioning me if the originals are not. And that really wasn't the intent, but I think the amount of work that goes into them results in them looking as much like an original as an original group. The relationship we've had with them in some way has proven to be really wonderful. And especially because most of the other artists that Hamilton Selway shows are people that I came up with, like Sean Michel, Aaron Handy, all those people. Um, that there are represented shown here makes it a very comfortable spot for the work to be, and a very natural um, place for the work to be shown. So I, I really have to give props to being at Hamilton Selway and Sean. It was just the perfect place for the work to be shown.